Lakshmi Tantra, Chapter 14 The True Nature of Shakti Shri God, Vasudev, is the Absolute Brahman. In essence, He is higher knowledge, undifferentiated with regard to space, time, etc., devoid of the three gunas, and pure. His nature is bliss. He is ever immutable, possesses six divine attributes, is undecaying and everlasting. I am his supreme Shakti, his I-hood. I am eternal, constant, and immutable. My Vyapara Shakti, power of action, is characterized by Sisriksha, my urge to create. With a billionth fraction of myself, I voluntarily embark on creation by differentiating myself into two separate energies, one of which is Chaitana, conscious, and the other is Chaitya, the object of its knowledge. Of these two, Chaitana is my Chit Shakti. In fact, Consciousness, consisting of myself, evolves into both sentient and insentient objects. Absolutely pure and sovereign consciousness is, indeed, my real form. Like boiling sugarcane juice, this consciousness becomes grosser through contact with material objects. Hence it is that in the process of cognizing material objects, the latter acquire the nature of consciousness. Just as fuel, when kindled, becomes engulfed by fire, so do perceptible material objects pervaded by consciousness adopt its nature. Polarized thinking, aware of objects such as blue, yellow, happiness, sorrow, etc., distinguishes undifferentiated pure consciousness by its variegated wealth of limiting conditions. Polarized thought is also one of my forms, voluntarily created by myself, whereby, viewed from an internal or external angle, perceptible material objects become classified as subject and object. Neither the external object nor the internal cognition constitutes the essence of my absolute consciousness. My selfhood splits itself into two components, the subjects who do the knowing and the objects capable of being known. That self of mine, which is beyond all polarized knowledge, free from the taint of words, and unaffected by any limiting condition, undergoes evolution in the form of perceptible material objects. When the mind is free of polarized thought, those perceptible material objects that attain the Madhyama Vritti, middle mode, become identified with consciousness. Just as the form existing in the eye is seen as being the form belonging to a particular external object, so also the form existing in the knowledge observed by the knower appears to belong to the thing known. Just as a burning piece of wood looks like fire, so perceptible material objects pervaded by consciousness are also perceived as consciousness. When the object is related to cognition by the knower, cognizer, and he reflects upon it, it is then myself, consisting of knowledge and ever revealed, who is in fact perceived as that object. I-hood is the essential characteristic of knowledge, distinguishing it from the object perceived. It is salakshana, unique, and that is my own self. Hence I, consisting of pure consciousness, am all-pervading.
When, in the ocean of consciousness, the only foothold left on the flooded island is the term connoting idangpada, this, and perceptible material objects are almost submerged, I then provide them with a support to hold on to. Those whose vasana, impressions, have all been washed away, removed by the nectar-like flow of meditation upon me, realize me, who am pure consciousness engulfing the multitudinous variety of objects as identical with themselves. People are of the opinion that, since I consist of knowledge alone, my function of revealing objects of knowledge, cognition, is an effect of avidya, about which I have spoken before. According to my true nature, I am neither tranquil, inert, nor creatively active, nor do I follow the middle course between these. I manifest myself as such in the true presentation of myself to those who are able to discern me with a calm mind devoid of polarized experience even in the waking state. But even when perceived by those who seek to know me while still influenced by polarization, I make them forget me. Just as an object, though lying right in front of a person, does not appear in his mind when preoccupied, so also am I not realized by those whose minds are afflicted by impressions, blurred by impressions left by the experience of mundane affairs, the mind fails to reflect truth. Just as a person desirous of understanding some particular object stills every other movement of his mind and through deep concentration grasps it immediately, Similarly, even during empirical existence, pure-souled persons realize my ever-manifest and sovereign self, embodying pure knowledge. As a garment which was originally white and is then dyed red, cannot be re-dyed in another color without first reverting to its original state. Similarly, how can he who has a notion of blue envisage yellow without taking the intermediate step of reverting to me, the essential pure consciousness. In the same way, whilst spelling out a sentence, how can one pass from letter to letter without pausing between letters in me, the essential pure consciousness? Thus, Although in essence I am pure and independent, still, after assuming one form and then passing on to another, I retain my pure nature during the intermediate state. I am always transcendental, and none of my modifications affect this fundamental trait. Also, even while undergoing all these modifications, I revert to my essential form in every intermediate state between two successive modifications. Thus, each modification is directly linked with my essential form. My true state of existence, illuminated by Agni and Soma, manifests itself as Padam, my abode in the Sushumna, when passage through the Ida and Pingala is checked. When Dhi, visionary higher thought and wisdom, is set free from contact with all external objects and is also not focused on any particular symbolic object, my true self is revealed in that vacant thought, that which continues to exist both in light and in darkness and reveals itself both in a positive and negative object is my undifferentiated form. Totally unattached I consciousness, revealed in the mind of the adept who completely renounces all craving for objects 
and whose mind delights in devotion to me is indeed my true body. The self of persons who practice renunciation and devotion and who have acquired true knowledge by distinguishing truth from untruth remains unaffected by the imposition of body, prana, life energy, etc., and completely identifies itself with my true state of being. As the rays of the sun become manifest at dawn but are not created anew, so too the essence of consciousness manifests in various states of being but has never been created. Just as the sun sometimes rises in the sky without there being any particular object to illuminate, so also does my true form, knowledge or consciousness, spontaneously manifest itself, even when there is no object to reveal. In the same way as crystal, being extremely transparent and unqualified, when tinted by flowers such as the hibiscus, cannot be perceived in its original state. I, also being transparent, cannot be perceived by people apart from the palpable objects created through my decisive will. That does not imply that I do not exist there separately from such objects. As the existence of gold cannot be perceived apart from the earrings made of it, and cannot be separately pointed out, and yet gold undoubtedly exists as gold. So also is my existence, which consists of consciousness, and is eternal, pure, and unaffected by either pleasure or pain, realizable solely through self-knowledge. My relationship to knowledge and its object which relates the cognizer with both the process of knowledge and its object, is characterized as pratyayarta, the essence of perception of objects. Space, time, and action are well known as bheda, the three factors differentiating one object from another. But what can distinguish sangvid, consciousness, which determines the distinctions between even these three distinguishing factors. Even time, with its components of past, present, and future, which is the fundamental cause of differentiation amongst perceptible material objects, becomes merged in the ocean of consciousness and is identified with it. When past and future merge in me, the eternally existent, the concept of the present is then also obliterated, because the present is a relative term dependent upon the concepts of past and future. I am the substratum of everything, but I cannot be enclosed in anything. Hence, there is no particular area of space that can be relegated to me as my substratum or support. I have no state exempt from consciousness. Therefore I, who am unique and of the nature of concentrated consciousness, am worshipped as the possessor of all forms. Time, place, kriya, action, karta, subject, karma, object, karana, instrumental object, sampradana, dative object, objects in their various positions of relation to action, and the consequences of actions, enjoyment and the enjoyer. All these merge in the self of consciousness. Gods, demons, nagas, gandharvas, the flocks of rakshasas, Vidyadharas, Pishachas, malevolent spirits, the elements, these eight ganas, groups of creatures other than the creatures of this world, men who classify themselves in diverse groups according to caste and function, cattle and mrigas, wild creatures, 
birds, serpents, plants, and also insects. The fourteen worlds, Bhu, Bhuvaha, Svaha, Tapa, Jana, Maha, Satya, and Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Prasatala, and Patala, existing in heaven and the nether regions. Mountains, rivers, islands, oceans, and other creations of the cosmic egg. The higher and lower realities, various collections of sounds, whatever can be regarded as being either the subject, object, instrument, or embodiment of enjoyment. The six sheaths and everything enclosed therein, consisting of both sentient and insentient objects. All existing objects, whether pure or impure, and the four aims of humankind, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, everything connected with prakriti and impelled by time, all these above mentioned both existent and non-existent objects, whether or not pervaded by me, merge in me and are contained in me. I, the pure and independent consciousness, pervade everything. I am recognized by the wise as the bliss and tranquility inherent in each state of being. Though that is my true nature, the jiva, chit-shakti, fettered by my tirobhava-shakti, does not discover or experience me spontaneously. However, after receiving a mere particle of my anugraha-shakti, chit-shakti discovers me instantaneously. Then, after propitiating me by various means, the jiva, known as chit-shakti, washes away all kleshas and blows away the dust of impressions, whereby the jiva, who has already severed all fetters through yoga meditation, fuses with true knowledge and attains me, who am Lakshmi, and whose nature is supreme bliss.